go off. So if you start snoring, we don't hear it. <laughs> Jim, would you mind opening us up uh, in prayer today? I would appreciate it. Jim, would you mind praying for us today? You're on mute, bud. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Father, we thank you. We thank you for protecting us through this storm that came through. We thank you that uh, that you will continue to protect those who are in its path. We thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for the word that we're going to receive this day. We ask that you plant the seed in our hearts so that we can live in a way that is pleasing to you. Father, thank you for Lynn and for all he does. And, and uh, he makes time for you to give your word to us. And we so much appreciate that. Thank you for all you do for us, dear Lord. We thank you in the name of your son, Jesus, as we're guided by your Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thanks, Jim. All right, guys, if you want to go ahead and mute yourselves, throw yourselves over on to chapter 37. Uh, we got a couple of uh, Ken wanted to say hello. He's got grandpa duty today, so he will not be able to join us. And then Donna is traveling in Missouri and asked, uh, uh, she'll be back next week, but we need to pray for her travel mercies, Donna back from Missouri. Uh, she's out there visiting some family. So that was your, your hellos and prayer requests for this week. Chapter 37 in Ezekiel is where we'll be today. We will finish the whole chapter. It's a moderately length chapter, so I don't expect to go long. And I'm gonna do something different today, uh, not to mix it up, but that's because the way the chapter is structured. Chapter 37 is almost two completely different messages in the same chapter. Remember when this was written, there weren't really chapter divisions like what we have in our, our, our English version Bibles. So what we just bookmarked as chapter 37, there's actually two completely different thoughts. So I'm gonna go through the first set and then we'll have kind of a main message for the first set. And then we'll go to the second set of scriptures in chapter 37. And there'll be a separate main message for that portion, the back half of, of chapter 37. So two messages. And there's also going to be two realities to this. As, as you remember, when we study books of prophecy, many times there's a near-term prophetic fulfillment that God has in mind, and then there's a long-term prophetic fulfillment. Now, I'm going to put a slight twist on that today. Um, there is a physical fulfillment of this scripture that we're going to go through today. The two messages will have two physical fulfillments, but there's also two spiritual fulfillments to these chapters. I hope you don't think I'm overreaching with the application uh, and how it applies to us in the New Testament. We'll see how it goes. And at the end of it, we can either do the, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down or, or rank me on the Amazon or Google scale and see how I do with the spiritual interpretations. But this is, um, you know how I get off on my sidebars and I get lost doing side research. So. I, I learned some cool stuff that I did not know. Uh, first of all, this is the section of scripture about the bones, the valley of the bones. And there's something in the back of my head and I couldn't place it. But um, so as I read on this, there was no mention of it, of course, in the scholarly literature. But in the 1920s, there was a song written. It was a black spiritual song, and it was called Dim Bones, D-E-M-B-O-N-E-S. And Dim Bones, the, the purpose for that um, black spiritual song, it was about Ezekiel, and it was taken from Ezekiel. Now, when I listened to some, oh, now this is how far off track I got. I was listening to some old black and white YouTube videos 
shot, you know, way back in the 30s and 40s from black gospel singers singing this song. And it is unrecognizable in its original form. It was sung like a, like a slow funeral dirge back in the day. When it was originally written, it was made to be a very slow paced, somber type of a song. Um, like I said, almost like something you would sing at a funeral. And what the original intent of the song, Dim Bones, was it was kind of a unifying spiritual song for the black people of that era because they were oppressed and the Jews were feeling hopeless and oppressed and it, they, they felt like there was nothing to look forward to and the song was to unify and give them hope that there was something in fact to look forward to. Now, that was interesting enough in and of itself, but I had absolutely no idea where the song was going to go because later on in the, I think in the 1950s range, the song was re-recorded, very upbeat and into almost a children's song. And this is the song that I remember as a kid, you would sing it as a nursery rhyme. The ankle bones connected to the leg bone, the leg bones connected to the thigh bone, the thigh bones connected to the hip bone, the hip bones connected to the whatever bone. And you would escalate the scale up as you went through each connecting bone. And it was turned into a children's song, a nursery rhyme, but that isn't how this song began and the song had its roots in the chapter this first section of 37 that we're going to go through today the song and the scriptures is not about resurrection it's not about our and it's been mistakenly credited where this is the spiritual application is this is talking about our resurrection no, 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 no. Our resurrection is going to be instantaneous, not piece by piece. Um, this is not about resurrection. This is about the nation of Israel being put back together again and better than it ever was. And I'll show you what the application is for us. I think it has more to do with salvation and sanctification than it does with resurrection as our spiritual application. So here we go. Verse one through verse three the Valley of the Bones. Sounds like a good sci-fi intro to Dr. Paul Bearer's monster movies on Saturday. Okay, the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed, they were very dry. And he, God, said to me, Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? So I answered very diplomatically, very uh, uh, correctly, O oh Lord God, you know. Now, First of all, we think this is a vision. Most scholars believe the way this is, it doesn't clearly come out and say, this is a vision given to me by God. But he seemed to be awake. He wasn't sleeping. This doesn't seem to be a dream. This almost seems to be what happened earlier in the book of Ezekiel when he was transported from where he was at in Babylon to Jerusalem. It happened. It was real. It happened in a vision. He could see things in real time, but he wasn't actually there. It was a vision. So we think this is, uh, we think this was actually happening to Ezekiel in a vision, not in a dream. And he says, he takes me and he puts me in this valley and it was full of bones. Now, he doesn't say there's a bone here and there's a bone there. And he, did, he also doesn't say the skull is connected to the spine and there's the rib cage, like, um, the, uh, the, the uh, oh gosh, I lost the name of it. There was a, I remember as a kid watching this 1950s sci-fi movie 
uh, teenagers from outer space, I believe it was called, and they had these terrible ray guns. And when they shot people, the next scene, they would be just, there'd just be a skeleton there. And I remember watching that like at seven or eight years old, something like that. It was a black and white uh, sci-fi movie. And the most terrible thing is they shot a German shepherd. And then the next scene, there's a skeleton of a dog lying there on the, in the desert. And I just remember that vividly. Um, this is not like that. These bones are not connected. They're scattered everywhere. There's a skull, there's a spine, there's a rib, there's a foot, there's an ankle, there's a knee, there's a hand. And he doesn't say there's a lot of them. He said the valley is filled full of them. Truly, this is the, 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 the pure definition of death valley. It was so dense with human bones. Um, so this is what he's seeing in his vision. And God asks him a question. I can almost picture God slightly smirking when he asks Ezekiel this question. Ezekiel, can these bones live? Now, these weren't just bone bones. These were, they were so dried up, they had become disconnected from one another. These were as dead as doornail bones. These were as bones as, as dry and lifeless as you could possibly be. And he goes, Ezekiel, do you think these bones can live? And, and Ezekiel is probably going, uh, 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 uh. the best way to answer this to God is, oh, Lord God, you know. In other words, he may not even have the faith or the vision to be able to see bones like this actually coming back to life. Verse four through six. Again, God said to me, Ezekiel, I want you to prophesy to these bones. And I want you to say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you. I will cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. God, once again, making that declarative statement that he makes all throughout the book of Ezekiel. Then you'll know that I am the Lord God. Um, so by all outward observations, Lee, if God asked you to do this, in the back, you may not verbalize it, but in the back of your head, you're going, uh, this seems like the silliest thing God could ever ask me to do. It seems like a vain and foolish act that he's asking me to do. Verse seven and eight, but he obeyed, key point. He obeyed anyway. So I prophesied as I was commanded. Maybe he didn't even believe it could happen, but he was obeying what God told him to do. Maybe he didn't have the faith, maybe he didn't have the vision, but he did it. Um, as I prophesied, there was a noise. By the way, later on, this went from a nursery rhyme to a famous Halloween song, Dim Bones. Another little tidbit about Dim Bones. And he hears a rattle, not just a rustle, not a whisper, but he, remember the old Halloween thing about bones rattling? Here's a rattle, there's a noise, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, can you imagine his eyes and the vision? They'd, they'd, be, as, they'd be this big around. They'd be like, what? As and here's this rattling sound and the bones start coming. Remember how thick they are. The whole valley's filled full of bones. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. So if, if Ezekiel did have any doubts, he put them away, he did what he was told, and then he was uh, literally blown away by what he was beginning to see right before his very eyes, verses nine through 10. Also, God said to me, now prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath and breathe on these dead that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath came into them and they lived and stood upon their feet an exceedingly great army. It's not a small army. It's not a medium-sized army. 
because of all the amount of bones that were in this valley, it was an exceedingly great army. So initially when he did the first part of his obedience, everything came together, but these were all lifeless forms, kind of reminds you of Adam, um, you know, in the garden, you know, he constructed them, but there was no life in the body. And he says, I want you to, to, to prophesy to the wind, to the breath. Now, the word in Hebrew for breath is also spirit, and it's also the same word the Hebrews use for the word wind. So interchangeably, breath, wind, spirit. So pray to the spirit to come in and inhabit these lifeless bodies. And the breath did, the wind did, the spirit did. Um, now, maybe this part was easier for Ezekiel to do because he'd already seen the bone snap together from all over the place. Here comes a rib bone flying in from two o'clock, you know, from, from 300 yards away. And here comes a, a finger bone from 10 o'clock coming in and they're all joined together and then the flesh gets on them. And so maybe praying for the breath was easier to do because he'd already seen so much accomplished right before his very eyes. Um, so he did complete. He did pray, and the supernatural work was now completed. Um, the breath of God came into these reanimated bodies, and there stood a great army, verses 11 through 14. Now, God's going to explain what's just happened, and this will end this first section of the chapter. Then God said to me, son of man, these bones, so he's going to say, this is what they represent in your vision. These bones are the whole house of Israel. They, the house of Israel, says, our bones are dry. Our hope is lost. See where I meant with this, with the, with the spiritual dim bones? Our hope is lost. We ourselves are cut off. Therefore, son of man, Ezekiel, I want you to prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord, Lord God. Behold, O oh my people, I will open your graves and I will cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O oh my people, brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. So now he explains, this is what this vision means. Because you got to imagine Ezekiel at this point is freaking out. He has no idea what this is supposed to mean. Now, we're going to develop this in the second part more. But I just want you to note for now that he says, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Again, uh, teaser, we'll talk about that in a second. The, the 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 Jews, the Israelites, they're lamenting because, guys, their nation has been obliterated. First, the Assyrians 150 years ago in the north conquered everybody, killed them or carried them away. There is no more northern kingdom. The southern king of Judah hangs on for another 150 years. By now, a new superpower rises, the Babylonians. And now we've seen through the book of Ezekiel, through 36 chapters, how they were conquered by the Babylonians and they were carried away and the city is burned and the walls are torn down and the temple is destroyed and they have nothing. They're living in exile in a foreign land. So they're lamenting and they're saying our hope is lost. Um, just words of despondency. They just realize that they are under divine discipline and they are now in a desolate place. Um, so God says, listen, the point of this vision is this. I know you feel like this and you should feel repentance for what you did was wrong, but there is hope. Guys, God never disciplines without showing you the hope of restoration. Do you understand that? He is not about punishing you for the sake of punishing you. He's not like some mean dad who gets his jollies off, taking his belt out of his, out of his pants loop just to wail on your rear end. That's not our God. He has to discipline you 
because you don't listen and he gives you a million chances and finally the discipline comes. But you know what comes with the discipline? Love, hope, restoration, promise of a new future, promise of a new beginning. Don't miss this point. And this is right here in chapter 37. He says, then you're going to know that I'm God. I'm going to restore you. I'll put my spirit in you. I'm going to put my breath in you. Everybody that lives in New Testament times, Lee, Jim, Ned, you have God's living breath in you right now as we speak. God has given you the Holy Spirit and he dwells in you and that breath is in you right now as we speak. So this for us, and now undeniably, this first part is about God's promised restoration of Israel. Not only is going to restore the people, he's going to restore the land as we went over in the last two chapters. So the whole thing's going to be better than it ever has been. But there is a spiritual application for us that we can use, us New Testament folks, the New Testament believers. Um, and I, I came across maybe uh, four or five things I wanted you to remember from this that you can apply to your life from this first section. So this is what it meant. This is what it meant for the Jews. But what can this mean for you? What does this mean for Dana? Number one, dry bones. Dry bones are not only dead, they're long dead. They are like hopeless dead. Bones are what remains when life has long since passed. However, look at what God did to them bones. We normally give up. We normally say, uh, my sister-in-law, not, not a true story. My sister-in-law, she's been rejecting Christ for 50 years. There's no hope. She, she, she's, an, she's been an atheist for 50 years. My, my dad, not true. My dad has nothing to do with God, and he's 83 years old. There's just, there's no point. What's the point in continuing to witness to him? Those bones are dry. Those bones are dead. People, no one, and I mean no one, is beyond hope because we serve a God that can assemble dry bones out of a desert, reconnect them, put sinews and flesh on, and breathe the spirit of life into them. Okay, the spiritual application, number one, is there is no one beyond hope. Do not give up hope on your loved ones. Do not give up hope on your friends. Do not give up hope on your family members or neighbors that God's put you around. Do not give up hope. To you, just like to Ezekiel, they may seem like dry, dead bones. And maybe the task that you're being given is seems uh, almost ridiculous, just like praying to bones. But and it may, and this is your point too. So that may seem pointless and impossible, but we must simply obey and do our part and let God do His. So first point: dry bones. Don't give up hope. Number two: no matter what you think, you do your part. Whatever God tells you to do, however he inserts you into that situation, you have to do your part. You let God do the assembling of the bones and the breathing in of life. That's not your job. But he'll give you something to do. And like Ezekiel, you just need to do it. See, part three, listen to what they say. Our bones are dry. Our hope is lost. We ourselves are cut off. The, the house of Israel had a reason to say this. They were being disciplined because they had practiced hundreds of years worth of idolatry, generations, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't repent of that. Their only hope was life and restoration through God. But they had to hit rock bottom. So your point number three is usually people will only come to God when they have come to the end of their self. Did you get that? So number one, don't give up hope on people. Number two, you got to do your part. 
Number three, usually, almost always, people have to come to God by getting to the end of themselves. They got to quit placing their faith, hope, and pride in themselves and get, get to that point of repentance like the nation of Israel did. Fourth point, he says, prophesy to the wind to breathe the spirit on these dead that they may live. The breath that God sends is the breath of the Holy Spirit. Guys, there are works that we do not understand that your role is this, God's role is this, and part of that has to do with the Holy Spirit coming in and rejuvenating what was once dead. Um, there are many denominations today, they're brothers and sisters in Christ, they will be in heaven with us, but they do not teach the active ministry of the Holy Spirit in today's church. That that ended when the Bible was completed at the time of the apostles. And that is not, in my opinion, a correct doctrine. I believe the Holy Spirit is active and involved very much so in the work of saving souls today, empowering people today. I believe that work of the Spirit is alive and well. And then the fifth and final point, once the great work has been accomplished, you've not given up hope, you've done your part, allowing God to do his, but you've done your part. You've looked for those people who are repentant and ready to come to the end of themselves. You allow the Holy Spirit to work in the situation. And now you have new life and there's an army and it's an exceedingly great army. Let's see what happens. Huh? What does an army do? They live to act under the orders of the one who gave them life. They're not a group of spectators. An army is a spectator sport. An army is a doer's sport. So once saved, there is work to do. It, it doesn't mean um, that we all just grab our harps and go float around on a cloud somewhere and wait for Jesus to come back. No, our work is to go about the Lord's business and cycle is repeated. A, B, C, D, get back to E. A, B, C, D, E, get back to A. It, it's just a cycle. We're to, we're to not leave up, give up hope on people. We're to do our parts. We're to allow God to do his part. We're to wait for the repentance to come. We're to watch the Holy Spirit work and breathe new life. And then we're encouraged them to do the same thing. Now you go out. Now you go out. Now you go out. Now you go out. And this is how the Christian church propagates itself and has through the centuries. So I'll close this section with a quote. G. Campbell Morgan, one of the guys that I like to read for these types of studies, says this. There is, and I'm, emphasis is going to be added by me, there is no hope for humanity in man, but these dry bones can live. By the word and by the spirit of God, men can be reborn and at last healed of their separations and united under one king. I wish I could write like that. That's just so beautifully written. Guys, you want to see, we said we went 36, gospel message 36. You want to see another gospel message? Read the first, first part of 37. There it is. And that's our recipe or formula that we can apply to us. The spiritual application is don't give up hope on people. Don't keep praying, keep working, do your part. Let God do his part. Look for those signs of repentance. Get out of the Holy Spirit's way. One of the things that I pray right before I come on here is 
if anybody knows me, I have, I can, I can, I can use this. I have the gift of gab. Uh, I can talk a lot and whether for good or bad, that's, uh, you know, that's just it. So what I always pray is Holy Spirit speak through me and shut Lynn up. Okay. Get out of the Holy Spirit's way. And once salvation has occurred, send them out, send them out, send them out because we're not to be fat sheep guys. We're not just sitting around in our church pews, getting fed, breaking bread, getting fed and getting fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter. And we can hardly get out the door as sheep. No, we're supposed to be lean, mean fighting machine sheep. We're supposed to be God's army. And because of that, that means that once we are fed, we're to go out and get more sheep because there's sheep all over the place and they're dying and they're going to wander off and fall into cliffs and get into trouble and be taken out by predators. And, and it's incumbent upon us to go out and do our part and go out and get more sheep. All right. Take yourselves off mute. Second part of chapter 37 is radically different. So we're, we're I'm just going to, do you have any questions We've got about a minute and a half. Do you have any questions about what we covered in the first part of chapter 37? Okay, guys, not all at once. I can't separate all the voices. <laughs> all right. So Paul is still with us because I heard him chuckle. And there he is. He's waving. So if we, if we take too long... He'll fall asleep. So do me a favor. Everybody, <laughs> make sure you hop back on within two minutes so we don't lose Paul. And I will see you back on the broadcast and we'll go over to the second part of chapter 37. See you back here in a few. Okay. I got to go to work. Bye, Dad.